second, you know, elevator pitch of why you should vote for them. Um, right. Sorry, I'm just checking. I've gone through. Yes, I think I've gone through everything. Everybody can know what we're doing? Yes? Okay. And our candidates are sitting in alphabetical order of first name, so there's no preference, and they will be, they will be speaking in order, so uh, Cedric will start with his two-minute presentation, and then when the questions start, the first question, Kiara will start, and then we'll take it in turns as to who starts first. Okay? So, could we have our first speaker? <laughs> yeah. So why not? Let me go over to speak and tell us in two minutes why you should vote for him. Good evening. I'd like to thank all of you for being here today. I'd like to thank the Legion for hosting and for the associations for moderating. Election time is an important time, and I'm really glad to see so many people out here this evening. My name is Cedric. I live just at the border of Western Mount Dennis. I'm part of a family business, an electrical company, Union Strong. But the reason why I'm here tonight is because I'm tired. I'm tired of transit that's late or full. I'm tired of potholes that I'm always having to avoid. I'm tired of seeing my neighbors, fellow citizens, struggling with issues at our corners. I know that a lot of you are tired as well. We're looking for more. We know that we can have more. But more will only come with a change. From my experience in business, collaboration is the way things get done. Without the general, without the engineer, Without the owner, no projects ever get built. And there's always difficulties that come up. But the best projects are the ones in which issues come up. We put our heads together and we find a way of getting through. So I'm here tonight looking and encouraging you to vote for me because I'm an individual who can get things done. And our next speaker, sorry, I forgot to remind you, you have all switched your phones off, haven't you? We don't want any bleeping going on in there. Sorry, small chairs coming out for you people at the back. First, thank everyone who played a part in organizing today's debate. This is a great turnout, and I love that it has exceeded expectations. My name is Chiara Padamani, and York Southwestern has always been my home. When my grandparents immigrated to Toronto, they came to York Southwestern, and they came to this community looking for a future of opportunity for their children. And my family has been here ever since. I grew up here, I went to school here, I live here in, with my husband, and now I'm a social worker in this community. I've always been so, so proud to call York Southwestern my home. But as a resident and as a social worker in this community, I have seen how this community, York Southwestern, has been neglected for decades. You can take a walk down any of our major streets and see so many examples of neglect and we deserve better. Over the last 30 years, our, ch our community has become a childcare desert, overcrowded buses, extreme flooding, and now we have one of the highest child poverty rates in the city when Toronto is already the child poverty capital of this country. But I'm running because it doesn't have to be this way. I'm running to bring the kind of community that my grandparents came here looking for. A community where it doesn't matter what your postal code is, your access to city services should be the same across the city. And we deserve better. It's why I'm running, and I'm looking forward to hearing more and sharing more about my plan with everyone here. This election is so important. We have the opportunity to demand 
change. If you believe it's time for change, if you believe the status quo hasn't been working for us because it hasn't, then I, I ask and implore you all to demand change this election. And vote for me, Chiara Paravani. Thank you. I have this opportunity to work on this land. I just wanted to acknowledge that before I speak. Many of you know I have represented this area for 30 years. But what most people don't know about me is that before I got into politics, uh, I am an Im immigrant, before I got into politics, I, I was a single mom. I was a single mom when my son was three months old. He's 44 now. And for, for all those years as a single mom, I had to work three jobs just to pay rent, to feed my son, and to be able to put him through school, and to survive. I know how difficult it is. We were very poor. And to work three jobs and to support and to be able to uh, live a life is very difficult, and I know that. And when I speak to single moms in my ward, I understand because I've experienced those challenges. I've lived at Martha Eaton Way, Woolner Buildings. I've lived throughout the, uh, the riding. And I've lived in York Southwest in since 1963. And I just want to say to everyone, thank you for coming out. And I hope that you will continue to support me as the counselor for Ward 5 in the next municipal election. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm sure you've all worked out that the yellow card is orange. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I know. I know. You see, she, she's, I told you, she, she's, she's tricky. Test, problem. she's testing you. Frank DiGiorgio. Thank you, Judith. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this debate. My name is Frank DiGiorgio, and I have been a counselor both in the city of North York and in the city of Toronto once it was amalgamated for a number of years. Let me begin by saying that uh, I have experienced poverty as well. As an immigrant that came over in 1953, I was six years old. My family was not rich. I financed my own education, both at the uh, university level, at the postgraduate level, and I had loans to pay back. So I've gone through a cycle that I think most people should have the opportunity to go through. In other words, you can't really appreciate poverty unless you've experienced it. That being said, there are two fundamental roles that I perform well as a counselor. One is an advocacy role, the other is accountability. As an advocate for the community that I represent, I establish, in consultation with the community, the needs of the community. I then go through the budgeting process and try to get my fair share of financial resources allocated to my community. On the accountability front, I need to understand due process. I need to understand city policies as they, as they apply to my community. Because if I don't understand the policies, then I can't protect my community. And I stand here, or sit here today in front of you, saying that my knowledge of due process and my knowledge of city policies is unparalleled. And no one, no one, no counselor protects their community better than I do. So, if you're looking for accountability, then you'll vote for Frank DiGiorgio. Thank you. Now, Fred Foster. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Fred Foster. Who am I, you ask? You may not have seen me before, but I'm going to let you know. Most of my friends and coworkers, they call me Honest Fred because I tell it the way it is. And let me tell you guys, the honest truth is this place is going to the crowd. You see it everywhere. You see it on your streets, you see it in transit, and soon you're going to see it because they're going to close 12 Division. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most crime-ridden, gang-infested community. These guys are not going to tell you, but I'm going to tell you straight. My friend who's a police officer who I went to school with, we went to Don Bosco, the same you know, school. Everyone knows Bosco because of Ford, right? Well, actually, the day, you know, the last day of school, I actually went there and, uh, you know, passed by the hall. Jenny comes up to me, he says, hey, are you going to be joining the team this year? I'm like, well, unfortunately, I can't. I just graduated. <coughs> that gentleman was Rob Ford, all right? He wanted me to be on his team because he, see some, he saw something in me. You know, who am I again? My name's Fred Fosu, all right? I 
was born in Ghana. My family, who were police officers, immigrated to Italy to have a better life. And then finally we settled in Canada, here. First in Montreal, and then finally in Toronto. Went to school in Royal Daycare on Weston Road. Went, we lived in the housing in, the, in Weston and Church, finally immigrating or settling into York Square, right by Eglinton. <coughs> yeah, I know this community. I know this community, I want to help protect this community. Currently, I'm a transit operator. I work for TTC, and I see there's two different ways the system runs. It runs for the haves downtown, and it doesn't run for the have-nots here. Okay, I go downtown, I do the King Street, three-minute service, you got three-minute service, and these downtowners complain while I'm driving down here, and you guys are waiting 30 minutes for transit. This is unacceptable. And we're not going to get change. Nothing's going to change if we stay with the same people for 30 years. Please, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Fred Fosu, and I'm asking for your vote October 22nd. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to all that is in attendance. Thank you to the folks that put this together. Thank you to the candidates that showed up this evening. My name is Lee Cam Oliver, and I'm running to be your city councilor in the new Ward 5. I moved to this country like many of us in this room, as a newcomer. I came here with a widowed mother. I had lost my father when I was a year old. It took us eight years to get back here, but we came here. And like many of you, we had to work hard. I grew up in Rexdale, Jamestown, and we struggled. And that same struggle was the reason why I said I wanted to be a social worker also. I've been an executive at Four Youth Initiative here in this community. Serve a thousand youth every year to try to ensure that they have access to prosperity. On top of that, I'm now an executive at Mars Discovery District, downtown Toronto, supporting businesses to grow and supporting people to access the future of work. For 30 years, we've had failed leadership in our community. We are in the bottom end of transit, of employment, of daycare services, access to supports. And we have been told that it cannot, that it will take long. Well, guess what? While we've been canvassing, while we've been working here, we've ensured that tenant rights have been supported by fighting for them to keep their rents low and their support system strong. While we've been working, we've been bringing city services to the forefront and bringing City of Toronto employers to the forefront to make sure that your basements no longer flood and somebody gives you answers. 30 years is enough. We need new energy, new opportunity. I've had nonprofit leadership, I've had government leadership, and private sector experience. It's time for real, authentic change. I'm here with my wife and my three children at Kilo Lawrence. I'm not doing this because it's lucrative. I'm doing this because I know my community needs real support for our neighborhood. It's time for a fresh start. I look forward to having a conversation with you this evening. Thank you. Keaton Austin. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry to, to be late. I was not really late. I went up to visit the family today. My name is Keaton Austin. I'm running for the City Council for York Southwestern. The reason why I'm running is because I run an organization called Young Lives Matter. What I see, a lot of young people is falling by the wayside. A lot of young people is falling to the drugs. And a lot of them is getting killed by the guns. Right around Western here, right around all over Scarlet, in Etobicoke, and I'm meet, meeting enough for 25 years. I'm trying to get the city and the government to do something about it. And it doesn't want to do nothing about it. And this is the reason why I'm running for a change. And if you elect me, I will be the best city council you can even call on and ask for advice. And I'll be able to answer my phone and serve my community in the best way I can. Thank you. So, uh, sorry, you have some people to call? So I have two 
Can you speak into the mic, please? I have two people, um, Albert Yu and Chris Thompson. Thank you. And while they're coming up, just to remind the speakers uh, that you have a minute to reply, and you will see an orange card 15 seconds before the end, and the red card needs to stop. So, read your question, tell us who your name is, read your question, and do not make a 10 minute speech. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, hi guys, my name is Albert Kuhl. Uh, I've lived in this uh, York Southwest for my whole life, so I just got a question right here. Uh, it's addressed to all candidates. So with the reduction to city council, councillors must now take on the responsibility of handling more constituents than ever before. So what makes each individual, what makes each of you the most qualified to take the job of representing a population that is double the size of our own board? Thank you. So Kiara, can you start first, please? Thank you for that question, Albert. And I want to start by saying that unlike our two current incumbents, I do believe that having the honor to represent 60,000 constituents is a full-time job. That said, I'm also a social worker, so I know what it's like to be overworked. And what I am committed to doing here in York Southwestern is the same thing I've been committed to doing as a social worker here. It's working hard for the people who live here. It's working hard for my neighbors, the people I grew up with. So I will be putting together a team from this community to help, to help respond to all of those constituency needs and opening a constituency office in York Southwestern because we have lacked one in this community for decades. And in my office, in my campaign office, in just my campaign office, we have already been able to help hundreds of tenants reduce their rents. We've already been able to help dozens of seniors get property tax and water rebate, people on, on subsidy programs for their basement. It has been incredible, the need for that kind of engagement in this community. And that's what I'm committed to continuing as your city councilor. Francis? I, uh, what I do, and I, and I have done for 30 years, I do house calls. I like to meet my residents one-on-one, -on -one, and that's worked. I go to their homes, I meet with them, and uh, um, why should I inconvenience my constituents to come to an office when I can go to their office? That's my job. Um, as far as politicians, I think we do have too many politicians. Um, but what I do think is that um, decision-making should be put into the hands of residents. Now, I know that uh, they, have a, uh, they, they do this in Los Angeles, um, and I think that I would like to try that and do that in Ward 5. I think Toronto needs to explore implementing a neighborhood council system similar to what they have in Los Angeles, uh, where neighborhood councils are made up of the people who live and work and own property in the neighborhood. Neighborhood council board members are uh, elected or selected uh, to their positions by the neighborhoods themselves. I think it would be a great system to have the community and the neighborhood engage in decision making rather than have just the politicians downtown making those decisions. Thank you. You have all switched off your phones, haven't you? Yes, I did. Thank you. Frank. Thank you. Um, first of all, I have had a constituency office in, in an industrial area. That was my way of uh, keeping costs down. I'm not on a major arterial road. Secondly, when it comes to how many people a politician can represent, really a politician has to surround himself with a team of people who can respond to the needs of the community. When somebody calls my office, they don't always get me directly, nor do I always directly respond to a request or a problem. It's my office staff that deals with the bureaucracy to make sure that the needs of the community are properly addressed. And so, I'll just give you a very quick uh, example. Recently, I had work done to protect against flooding. The bureaucracy assured me and my community, yes, if we do these things, your problems are going to be solved. Well, the problems weren't solved. We experienced not perhaps as severe as five years ago, but we had flooding again. So somebody has to be held accountable. Not my team, 
bureaucracy. Thank you. Fred? So what you just witnessed is a prime example of no accountability. You're going to hear a lot of talk. You're going to hear a lot of scripted words. But I'm going to speak straight from the heart. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm a TTC operator. You know how hard it is, how many people we deal with on a daily basis. How many, like I deal with it all, okay? Like drug guards, people, like you name it. You, you've been on, you, I don't need to tell you what goes on in the TTC, all right? In terms of campaign offices, well, you know, my opponent beside me, yeah, he does have a campaign office, it's, and nobody sees it. I lived here for, you know, most of my life. And I never saw a city councilor. I didn't even know we had one. Come to find out that his campaign office is literally right beside a legal massage partner. That's where his campaign is. Don't believe me? Go find out. You know, this is the truth, OK? These are these, this is This is the truth. Go check it out. In terms of finding me, I'm going to give you my number, my personal number. You're not going to have to go through staff. 416-918-6693, 416-918-6693. My name is Fred Fosu, you need me, you give me a call, I'm gonna deal with it. Thank you. All right, thank you for that, for that question. So, as folks in the, in the room know, right, I have years of leadership and management experience. I know how to hire staff and bring in good people. In this community, this is what I've pledged that I will return your call within 24 hours, that I will come to your door and speak to you about your issues, that you will not have to chase me, that I will come to you, that I'll hire competent and confident staff to work for you and work on your behalf. Also, I want to ensure this, that your voice is at the center of conversations, that decisions are not made about you without you, so what I want to do is this. I will create local councils in the community. Every neighborhood will have a council that reports directly to you as a large body, and my office will be in each one of them. Those councils will ensure that I hear your voice. But on top of that, that we are working collectively together to build a more strong and effective community. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for a fresh start. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> I have a cut to the chase. Out to all of my opponents, I'm a suitable candidate because I deal with a lot of problems in the community. I deal with them. Every day I have a problem with parents. The kids are not going to school from Western Road straight to Scarlet and Jameson, wherever you want to call it. That's a big enough war to deal with. And I'm there for everybody. And I will say that if you guys elect me, every six months I meet with everybody in the ward at a town hall meeting and you tell me what you want me to do to improve on your community, to make it much safer. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, more chairs coming through. Okay, just a reminder, if you do want to ask a question, put your hand up. Our volunteers will come and give you a question form to write your question down and uh, it, for it to go to the question team. So, sorry, who? Sorry, more people, no guarantee of more resources to go along with it. How does each one of our voices get heard? Ultimately, Albert, I think this could be a combination. You're going to have to have a counselor such as myself who doesn't just walk by you on the street, open. We know what it's like to walk by someone who's open and willing to talk. There's also the other business of city council. So having a team, a team of like-minded individuals from the community who understand the needs of the community. If I'm to be elected, I'll have something that I like to call Western Wednesdays, in which that day, specifically myself, be in my office, 
so that the one-on-one -on -one conversations with my constituents can happen. We have to be here on the ground with being in front of you for real change to happen. Thank you, Albert. Thank you. Okay, who, who will be the next uh, questioner after Chris? Someone named Evan. Uh, my name is Chris Tongs, and I reside in the uh, Keele and Lawrence area. I've uh, lived in New York Southwest and my whole life. My question is this, and I know there's many priorities within New York Southwest, but I want to understand from each of you, what do you see as the single most pressing issue facing New York, New York Southwest in this election? Just a little question. <laughs> the single most important. Right. Francis, you start. Wow. There's so many, Chris. I know. Well, let's switch that off. Sorry. Sorry, I think some of these are Well, um, I, think, I think what's important, um, and what I think is very important in, in York Southwest and is community safety. Um, I think that's an issue uh, that has come up over and over again with residents uh, that have contacted my office. Um, that uh, there has been parts of the ward where cars have been vandalized and uh, broken into, break and enters, and people don't feel safe. And I, I think what, what's important is um, that we engage the community and uh, the community to work, to work with the various organizations that we have in York Southwest and, and, have, um, and have a partnership and, and with, with the local police. We need to get the police back to the way we were years ago where there was the interaction with the police and the community and the young youth in the community. Uh, to me, I, I think that's uh, a real issue in York Southwest and that's what I'm hearing over and over again at the doors. And um, I, I think um, that's, I, I think I speak on behalf of a, a lot of residents that live in York Southwest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I would agree with my colleague that um, having healthy and safe communities seems to be an emerging issue for all of the residents throughout York Southwest. And, and as I've advocated on a number of occasions already, I've said, look, to deal with that issue, that complex issue, we have to go back on the notion of teamwork. There are a lot of people that have to be a part of the solution. We have to look to the parents, we have to look to the schools, we have to look to the counselors, we have to look to the surrounding community. The level of safety in any neighborhood is determined by the people that live in that neighborhood. They must participate in establishing the level of safety that they feel comfortable with. And so one of the first things I would do is I would reach out to a lot of the communities that are identified like for the Green Hills Community Group or the group that where Chris Tonks live, they are have fun. Oh, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you. Fred? Ladies and gentlemen, um, 12 Division is set to close. Let me repeat that. 12 Division is set to close. 12 Division protects all of you. Okay. What's going to happen when they close? Um, it's going to close. I spoke to my police officer friend, and he says they're on schedule to close. And he, excuse me, stop. Thank you. Okay. This is this is the fact. This place is going to turn into another Chicago. Your property value is going to go down because crime is going up. This isn't a matter of opinion. It's a matter of fact. Look at the numbers. There have been 19 shootings this year alone. Last year. It was 11, so we're nearly double, and the year hasn't even ended yet. Not to mention all the breaking and entering. You know, I'm in constant communication with all my friends, where I went to school with. Some of them are lawyers, some of them are police officers. And they tell me this place is, it's, it's going down. You, you don't even need me to tell you. Just look at the corner. You see panhandles everywhere. What's going to happen when there's weed shops in every corner? We marijuana is set to open. They're not going to stop it. It's going to fester. And you're, I'm telling you, protect your family. 
protect your property. You need to vote wisely. Don't vote just because you know the person's name or they went to a park or something. You need to make an educated decision on this one, please. Thank you. As most of you in the room know, I have been impacted by, by gun violence. Before I was 20, I had lost 10 friends to gun violence. It's real. In our community over the last eight months, homicides have increased 200%. Theft has increased by 40%. Robberies by 10%. People are saying they don't feel safe leaving their home. There's Facebook groups that we've brought together with folks in the room that have begun to do some work. We need leadership now. Day one, I'm creating a local safety council made up of residents like you, folks from my office, young people, and, sub and police officers and subject matter experts on violence prevention. We will build a plan, we will build it together, and we'll ensure that on a, on a three month basis, reporting back to me and I'm reporting back to you. On top of that, every young person in this community that wants a mentor will have a mentor because a mentor saved my life. And finally, we will ensure that there's good jobs for our young people and for people in this community by ensuring that we bring new opportunities to our area. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will answer the jobs in this community need to be saved. Supposed to be more jobs. The crime rate in this community, I mentor kids, I teach a trade school, and I think the best way for these young people in this community, in York Southwestern, is trades. Taught them trades properly, teach them it, and you will see. There will be no violence occurring in the community. Right. The community could be safe. Number two, I believe the police budget should never be get cut. It should be more police on the road. Number three, I think there should be surveillance cameras on the road monitored by the city, by a special part of the city. And if I get elected, I will make certain that happen. Thank you. Thank you. Chris, in my mind, safety, of course, is a big issue, but ultimately it comes down to respect. Many of the different things that all of us up here have been talking about, you're not shorted if you're respected. And what we need is respect to come back to our neighborhood of Weston and York South. Respect from the larger council, respect that we have to each other here in the room. A lot of issues can be solved when people on the ground see it, get engaged and do something about it. But when they're bigger than that, that's when you need a counselor. Someone who you can approach, you feel comfortable in approaching, who can get on those issues. Can your counselor just solve it? If not, we have to have collaboration collaboration with the other council members. Now that we're down to 25, this vote means a lot more than it did at one time. I'm willing to use it. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Chris. I want to say that my priority, the one priority I want to handle as city councilor for York Southwestern is addressing inequality because that is the root of all of the evils in York Southwestern. When we talk about building a safer community, the only way that has been proven to reduce crime in any city has been addressing the root causes. And that means addressing inequality and it means addressing poverty. And just down the street, I was going to York Memorial and I was graduating during the summer of the gun. And that was the first time I realized how unequal of a city we're living in. Because as I was preparing to go to university, I had classmates who were losing their lives to gun violence. 
when I am a social worker now, I am talking to youth mentors who say it's easier for our young people to get a gun than a job. That is a problem. That's when we are failing our young people. If we want to build an equitable city, an inclusive city, we need to start tackling inequality. And unlike our two current incumbents who have voted over and over again to increase poverty, and child poverty in this community has increased under their 30 years of leadership here, I want to take a leadership role in reducing that. And I'm not going to be afraid to vote that way at council. Thank you, Kim. Uh, can I just point out that uh, Peter from Jane Dundas uh, Community Association is uh, videoing this and he's going to tweet it out and he's going to tweet it over to Mount Dennis and to Western and other community associations so they can tweet it out. So if you have friends and neighbours who were not able to be here tonight to hear what our uh, candidates have to say, that's a way that you can find out about it. Okay, so just a reminder, if you want to ask a question, put your hand up, the steward will give you a form to write a question on, and then you take it to the back of the question team. Sorry, who's next? Well, I, I am actually going to uh, be the proxy for somebody who actually can't get in. So here's his question. It's on accessibility. Why in 2018 are they still holding all candidates' debates in facilities that are not wheelchair accessible, this shows a lack of forethought by the organizers and by the candidates. What will you do to change this? Thank you. Frank? Thank you, and that's an excellent question. Um, the council has adopted policies to increase access for people who are challenged physically. But like all changes of a nature that require making changes to facilities. Those things cannot be done overnight. We all want more, but you know what? The answer to we all want more is, tell me who is going to pay. Who is willing to pay to change all the buildings that the city owns across the city to make them accessible for disabled people starting next month? Who is going to pay? And if you can give me that answer, I'll be the best politician in town. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> answer the question. Yeah. King? Yeah. Sorry, can you, uh, Fred, sorry, Fred, your turn next. Can you pass the mic, Fred? Yeah, this prime example of typical politician, excuses, excuses, excuses. You know, we don't have the money to pay for. At one point, he was the budget chief. He was the budget chief. He. Yeah, he, he, he controlled the money. And what did he do for his own community? Nothing. As a streetcar operator, I see like, like downtown, how it's rising up communities like Regent Park. They're building all these new infrastructure and all these buildings. And I come here, and I'm like, what's going on? Like, who's res the first, you know, the number one thing people ask me is, hey, you know, why, why are you always late? You know, well, because the politicians, they're the ones who control the routing. And if they allocate certain routes, you know, for, for downtown and leave you guys behind, well, so be it. And that's what's going on. They leave you behind. The city is scheduled or supposedly supposed to make all areas uh, accessibility friendly by 20, you know, 25. That is what their goal is. It's not going to happen because we have people, politicians, managing things that they have no control. They simply don't have a clue. That's the primary you know, reason why it's not getting done. They don't have a clue. They do not care. They're only concerned about their own jobs. They don't care about your jobs or your accessibility. This is the Thank truth. You. So Thank you. folks, you know, please do wisely. Thank you. Uh, sorry, just one second. Uh, uh, Doug from the Legion. Is Doug from the Legion here? Oh, you found him. Simon, have you found him? Thank you. Sorry, we're just trying to do some amount of ventilation. Sorry about that. Lee can. Is that too noisy, the air conditioner? No. Can folks hear me at the back? I, I spoke to the man and it broke my heart that he couldn't come upstairs and I said that I will come see him tomorrow to talk to him about what we spoke about here. AODA is a provincially passed mandate that every building has to be accessible. It is a responsibility. 
And what you just heard is 30 years of failed excuses and failed exercise in our community. That it cannot be done because we don't want to be innovative to try to find solutions. I reject it. I reject the politics of we, we're not good enough. I reject the politics of we can't find enough. I reject the politics of we cannot be innovative. In our community, we work hard. And we need a politician who will work hard and strategic for our community. It's time for a fresh start and someone who's thinking about you at the center of their decision making. Thank you. As a son, it must have to be a wheelchair inside of each and every building for people to get to come up on it to, to attend stuff. What after 10. It is not right for somebody out there cannot come in. <coughs> right. Forget that 10. What after 10. If I'm elected, I will cut all the red tape out and make it very easy to everybody to put a wheelchair part for everybody get to come in to attend what they after 10. Because it is not right for the city is holding back stuff, finance and those type of stuff, and funding, and cut out the red tape. Because my two colleagues, my two, my two incumbent, they are the ones is to be wanted to get things to be fixed properly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, it comes down to respect. If we respect those, who have accessibility issues, as much as we do ourselves, we allocate the money. It's not, it's not about finding. It's taxes. We're all paying into it. It's about us saying our taxes, a certain portion goes to that. So you start first with the government buildings that we have in the area, a guarantee. A certain amount of buildings become accessible term after term. And if necessary, we find ways to work with communities. The Legion, a great community building. If they're short on the cash, we have to find ways of helping them be more accessible to the community members who want to use the facility. It shouldn't happen, not in 2018. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Unlike our incumbent councillors who like to speak a lot about accountability and how much things will cost, where was the accountability when both of you supported the one-stop subway extension in Scarborough? Do you know how much ramps, you know how many ramps we can build with three billion taxpayer dollars? It's unacceptable. Those kinds of excuses are unacceptable. It's why I'm running for city council and I am fully committed to making our community more accessible. We have one of the highest disability rates in the city of Toronto. So it is ingrained in my platform. In fact, I am the only candidate here with an accessible office. And I built that rent myself so that Mr. Campbell could come and visit my office. So that anybody in a wheelchair could get to my office and engage with the person who wants to represent them at City Hall. That's what I've done. And I'm not even your city councillor yet. Thank you. Thank you. What I have done is in on Western Road, along all the main streets, that we had ramps um, because a lot of the sidewalks didn't have the ramps for uh, wheelchairs. Uh, please do not interrupt. Um, also, um, and it's absolutely correct, um, some of the older buildings, they don't have the accessible um, ramps into their buildings. Um, we, uh, what we have done and what I'm doing in Weston is that we are widening the sidewalks um, along Weston Road to make it more accessible for wheelchairs, seniors, and as well, with the buildings, and uh, Councillor DeGiorgio talked about who's going to be paying uh, for some of these buildings, but 
Uh, a year ago, we licensed all apartment buildings and everybody thought we couldn't do it. So we forced landlords to clean up their buildings, especially some of these slum landlords. So we could do the same with encouraging them and making it mandatory that they have their buildings accessible. And that's what I will fight for. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I could just do a little bit of explanation, Mount Dennis Community Association has made every attempt to find an accessible building. There used to be a stair ramp here, uh, which is now broken. The only other large building for a meeting in Mount Dennis is the church at the corner of Guestville and Dennis, uh, which has an elevator, and we felt that we couldn't have a meeting in a multi-faith community in a church that some people might find that, uh, find that difficult. Well, if you want to pay for schools, fine. Thank you. Can we have the next question? Excuse me. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you. Next question, sir. So we have Evan who's been patiently waiting. And the next person up is Anna Lucas. Uh, some of you have touched on the issue uh, already, but uh, if you have, maybe you can get into some more specifics. And if you haven't, perhaps you can address the question. Uh, <laughs> Just leaving aside the issue of policing, and, and that's no disrespect to police, we all agree that closing 12th Division would be a problem if that issue occur. But what I want, I'm asking you to focus on is some creative solutions to address the problem of youth violence in our community. Thank you, Fred. <coughs> when you're poor, there's no crime. Simply put, there's no jobs. All the businesses are closing. You see all the four leases. All the four lease signs all over, this is crumbling. You know, we need to find, we need to give people options. You know, like when I was growing up here, you know, I had, there were options. First job was at the exhibition. Worked there, made $9 an hour. I was really happy. But other people made other choices. They, they didn't want to work. They'd much rather have it easy and sell drugs, pedal, you know, that's what they would rather do. We need to give them options. But when, when you're hopeless and you think there's, there's no way, you resort to these crimes. We've got to give kids growing up options, community centers, you know, like the communities is, is run down. I don't see anybody in the park playing anymore. You know, all, like they're even closing schools. Boiling. I was there at the meeting at Boiling when people were, were complaining saying that you can't close our schools. Same excuse. Oh, well, you know, nothing we could do about it. So that's what you're going to have. If you close the schools, close the police, what, what's going to happen? In this place, marijuana shops, poverty, crime, it, it's, it's a secular cycle. You need to close that cycle, give the kids opportunity and jobs. It's the only solution. Thank you. Thank you. Lika? Thank you again for that question. As you know, this is an important topic, too, right? When I was, as, as an executive of Four Youth Initiative in Toronto, which is at Kila Law, Kila Negleton, I we serve about a thousand youth a year. Number one priority is to ensure that we provide real opportunities to these young people to stay out of trouble. The things that I would do in this community is ensure there's actually real mentorship programs for young people. Because we know when somebody pours into you, change happens internally. Number two. I will ensure that there's good jobs during the summer. How? By ensuring that all new development, 10% of jobs go air into this community. As chair of TCBN, I helped that happen on the Ellie Clinton LRT. And I want to bring it here into our neighborhood. Finally, we need to ensure that our young people are connected to role models, right, to their parents. Right? by ensuring that parents also have good paying opportunities here. These things are multifaceted and requires innovative solutions. And I'm promising you, as your city councilor, I'm committed to working together with you to reduce crime in our community. Thank you. Thank you. The crime in this community can easily solve by, I run an organization called Young Lives Matter. 
I teach the kids where to go to find safe jobs, good jobs. Right? You cannot have a kid, a young man, have one criminal record, one criminal record, and he's getting penalized. You have this criminal record two or three years ago. He never committed no more crime and he's getting penalized. What I will do is we get that criminal record, remove and get that young man in the right job what he's supposed to have and get him to continue working. And the next thing I will do is to get a lot of age resting place when I walk around here, waiting to teach the kids them how to do barber and how to do age dressing. And you can get the kids them to do it the right way and create, create, create an entrepreneur in the right way and got them to do the best things of their life, what they wanted to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One of the things I appreciate from this particular topic is that we're hearing a lot of agreement that is opportunity at the core of why crime happens. So, we've got two individuals on the end of organizations. I want to commend them for the work that they've done. But we have to have more of those organizations working together. We need a network. Individually, great things are happening. Lives are changing, but similarly, the city cannot shirk its responsibility. This neighborhood is not quote unquote poor just because. It's the decisions that are made at City Hall and the allocation of money that contributes to the situation that we have. 30 years, two individuals, and yet we, f we see the direction going south. Vote for me, and let's turn the arrow the opposite way. Thank you, Evan, for that question. I wish I had a creative solution for you, but the solution I have is one that this community has been saying over and over and over again. It's just that our leaders and our local representatives haven't been listening. And the solution is tackling the root causes. It's tackling poverty. It's tackling inequality. How do we do that? How do we do that? It starts with childcare. Like I said at the beginning, we are living in the child poverty capital of the country. One in four children in Toronto are living below, below the poverty line. One in three in York Southwest End. So instead of voting against the expansion of childcare like our incumbent has done in this ward, I want to expand childcare and make sure that subsidies are actually getting to the people who need them. I don't want to give any more handouts to big corporations by cutting out and, and giving them incentives. I want to make sure that we are giving the help to the people who need them because that's how we prevent a young person from falling through the cracks and joining a gang. That is the only way we prevent that from happening. When they're very young, we have to we have to work with the youth at a very very young age, and that's uh, that's uh, through the education through their schools. And I think the I, I think that's where uh, a lot of the youth are they're failing is through the education process. Uh, sorry, Chris, uh, I know you're here, but um, but jobs definitely je uh, we need to create more jobs for youth. And I know that in um, in in York Southwestern, that uh, there was a motion that I passed at the executive committee uh, to hire local youth and especially Hammerheads that's located on Western Road to work the to work along the corridor when Metro Lynx was building the line and as well they're doing that on the Eglinton line as well. Uh, the mall that was built at St. Clair and Keel created a, a hundreds of jobs for youth in the community. What I would like to see is the federal government or the provincial government giving financial incentive to some of the small businesses that we have in the, in the community uh, to hire the local youth. And I think that, that I think that's a win-win, not only for the youth, but as well as for the businesses that are operating um, in our community, because they're also creating the jobs. Thank you. Thank you. I want to just focus on one part 
one essential part. I called it volunteerism. One of the things that in my history, um, I was a teacher, I was a football coach, and I can remember when I was teaching that I would stay till four or five o'clock pretty well every night of the week providing extra help for students. I coached football. As a matter of fact, my coaching football allowed me to have a relationship with uh, Rob Ford because Rob Ford coached football and he reached a lot of people. In his own special way, he was able to motivate some kids that played football for him to somehow try and stay away from crime. In my view, in knowing, and he himself had problems, but he was successful in reaching a number of students, as I was when I coached. It comes back to some people have to give back to the community. The teachers themselves, the, the teaching environment is quite different today than what it was when I was teaching. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Before we have this lovely lady come up, could we have a Tony who didn't give his last name who's asking about um, flooding? Weston for 15 years. My question for all of you is, since it is quite apparent that development in York Southwestern is inevitable, what will each of you do to ensure that building development guidelines will be adhered to and that the local residents who've lived here for years will not be displaced? Thank you. You can. Thank you so much for that question. I believe fundamentally that community needs to be at the center of all decision making locally as it relates to development. So on day one, this is what I want to do. I want to develop a local development council made up of residents like yourself, <coughs> folks in my office, and the city development planning group. We will ensure that the history, the, the culture of our community is not missed or displaced. On top of that, I will be your chief marketing officer and I will go and find development that you said you want and you require in your neighborhood so it represents who you are. On top of that, I want to ensure that we're not just building up, we're building downwards. And flooding is a major issue and major concern. So infrastructure is a key part of our development cycle that we need to look at. Finally, I want to ensure this, that if the community says, that we want to hold off in a little bit to catch up on infrastructure before we bring in new development, then I'm open to it and I'm willing to do that. But in our neighborhood, I want to make sure that there's local development councils made up of residents at the center of decision making. We will no longer be reactive to developers, we'll be proactive in finding the type of development that we want in our community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For that, right, what I would do is every developer is not going to leave the people who live in York Southwestern behind and develop a project without having them involved in it. No more will be no more homelessness, no more, no more poverty. Every developer will have to obey by the rules of the people who live in the, on Western, the of Southwestern. And they will have to do it the right way and the proper way. And that's what I will enforce and make certain it will come to the community before any developer. If that were drawing, it come to the community first and let the, let the people in the of Southwestern approve it before we go ahead. Thank you. So great. So one of the main things in my campaign is growth, not gentrification. There's a lot of space here. We're an open people. Others can come join us. The key to it is ensuring that for them to come, we don't get pushed out. That's done by appropriate rent controls and enforced rent controls. Just, just saying that you've got the control and never have anyone from the city Verifying whether or not they're being adhered to doesn't work. It's about working with the developers, right? There's, some, there's something attractive here why they're coming. 
So if they're coming, they have to give something up. The Section 37 money, we've got, what, $2,500? Surely we can do better than that. Surely we can do better than that. There's trade-offs in life, but currently, there's no trade-off that's leaving any money in our collective pockets. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for the question, because this is exactly why I'm running now. It is an urgent question, and we need to make sure we're electing the right person to deal with it. Unlike our two current incumbents, I don't believe in giving developers who are going to be profiting off of our community millions of dollars in tax incentives. I don't believe in it. I believe we need to be negotiating tougher community benefits agreements. We need to be standing up for the people in this community so that we don't get pushed out. The reason why development is inevitable here is because we're about to have the second largest transit hub in the city of Toronto. That is plenty of incentive for developers. So what I want to do to make sure that that doesn't happen is one, what I've already been doing and showing through my campaign. One, I am only going to be accountable to the people here. It's why I've turned down donations from developers. That's why I've turned them down. And the two incumbents sitting next to me cannot say the same thing. They can't, and I would challenge them to do so. The second thing I want to do, and what I have been doing and showing in my campaign, is I've already been standing up for the people who are being pushed out. Just last week, we helped a, a, a building get organized into a tenants association, and they were able, with my support, to reduce their rent increase by 2%. We need to be doing more for the people who need it, not giving out favors to the people making donations to our campaign. Thank you. jobs and employment and as a social worker obviously you should know that right by closing the door to development is uh, really closing the door to jobs in the community and when it comes to development incentives um, and I'm very proud of what we did at 22 John Street uh, for Weston um, the uh, we got uh, 20 a uh, rock work to build um, a development along John Street. It went through a lot of consultation meetings with the community. ULI uh, was involved in that as well. And uh, because the Up Expression Go Station, uh, we thought would bring incentives for development, but unfortunately it didn't. So with this project, what, what the incentives and what we did work with Rockport and uh, the two mayor candidates supported it unanimously on this uh, on this topic. It is the incentives they received was for Artscape to build affordable housing and uh, the Contra Hub and the Western Farmers Market. That's what we got for incentives. There was no freebies for developers. They gave back to the community and built what we wanted in the community. So obviously, they're very inexperienced to understand development charging. Thank you. First of all, two, uh, two aspects of development. There's proactive development where, as a councillor, I would try and go out and try and attract people to revitalize a community. So there's a proactive development that I'm supporting, the redevelopment of the Leon lands. We're talking about 40 acres. And if that development manages to come forward, we're going to be looking at 9,000 jobs being created, state-of-the-art buildings, office buildings that will be catering to or supplying materials to the hospital on Wilson Avenue, but that particular development will run into roadblocks by the provincial government. There is also the responsive kind of development. When somebody, developer comes forward and says, here's what I'd like to do, and I say to them, well, you'll have to follow a process, and we'll see what, where we end up. The developer says, no, no, I don't follow a process. I'm going to get my way or the highway. Well, I can tell you, there is a development that went through on that basis where the developer said, my way or the highway, and he may go bankrupt. Thank you. Right on, Frank. Thank you. You need to support the small business. That's key, supporting small business. When you take your money and you put it somewhere else, the community that you are in gets poorer and poorer, and that other community gets richer and richer. It's just the facts. We need to support the small businesses. That is what I would be advocating. Shop local. 
you know, support the little guy. This used to be a community, you know, but now all, all of our infrastructure is crumbling and it's being done purposely. Why? Because they want to gentrify this place. They're closing hospitals and putting up condos. They want to close Twelve Vision and put a condo there. That's what they want to do. They want to make this like another Manhattan where you have to be rich to live here. So what do they do? They drive out the businesses, they increase your property tax, they increase all of that so that you can't afford it and you say, you know what, I give up, I'm going to move somewhere else, but there's nowhere to go. We need to develop this place. That's what we need to do. You're, you need to be first, not those condo developers. Just follow the money. You know, if, if a condo developer gives your campaign money, guess what? They're going to want something in back. You're going to be, they're going to be accountable to the condo developer. I want to be accountable to you. So ladies and gentlemen, October 22nd, please vote Fred Fosu. People first, not politicians. Thank you, Thank you Fred. Okay. Sir? Before we have our next person, I just want to say that I What have any of you done tangibly to prevent the ongoing problem of flooding along the Lions corridor on North South Western? Thank you. Keaton? I would have to look, go to the city planner first and find out why it's flooding. And then after that, I would get the architect to come in and figure out the problem and make a better drainage system to make it not flood anymore. That's what I would do first. Okay, Cedric. So, the City of Toronto had a flooding plan, which Mayor Tory got tabled, which of course would have raised the money that would allow us to really make some solid improvements to infrastructure, especially on the flooding, on the flooding front. That money was to be dedicated for it. I get voted in. I said, hey, let's take it off the table and let's put it into action. Action that we need, action that we use for the citizens here. You shouldn't have to pay twice. You pay your taxes and then you have to pay to get your basement fixed again. Don't let them double dip. Vote center. Thank you, Tony, for that very important question because we are living in an era of climate change and we need to take action about this. Unlike our two current councillors who voted to shelve the stormwater management plan, and unlike the councillor sitting next to me who supported the sale of the floodplain along the corridor that you're speaking with, I worked actively with the community to prevent that sale. And because our councillors supported it this time last year, it went through with zero consultation for the community. I deputed at the TRCA. I have mobilized the community around this and worked with different community organizations to mobilize around this issue. I've knocked on doors and talked to people in one of the most flooding prone neighborhoods who had no idea that the city gives them a subsidy to make their basement flooding proof. And I helped them apply for that. It's another reason why my campaign office is important to have a constituency office. So people know what are the, pro what are the programs and the, the policies that are able to help them. This is a community that is prone to flooding, and we knew that for 30 years. Thank you, Kim. We've had two councillors who have sat on their hands around flooding prevention, and I want to take action. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, well, what I actually did in the last flooding is I actually went to the uh, residents and helped them clean the garbage and had the garbage removed. Um, so what I have done, and that was the question, is that I successfully advocated for the City of Toronto to, uh, to uh, uh, ask the federal government for funding uh, through the National Disaster Mitigation Program. Now even if we don't get that fi funding, uh, we have made a commitment that we will fund the project in Rockcliffe along the channel. The channel is owned by TRCA. 
Um, and we are waiting, and even if uh, uh, TRCA, we're waiting for TRCA to do the design, that we would do the design and that work is going to be done next year. Unlike in, uh, in, uh, in um, Ward 12, is where the work was done and we still have basement flooding. I think that's a big issue. Why We should have answers on that. If the city spent over $20 million doing the work and they st they're still getting flooding, that's a question that we should all be asking, and I promise I will get that answer. Thank you. Thank you. Picking up on the heels of uh, that comment, I can tell you that once my community experienced flooding again, I held a meeting of this nature and basically took the heat, took all the anger that said, you assured us that if you went through and enlarged the pipes under some of these streets that we would be no longer suffering flooding. Well, I'm not an engineer. I relied on the engineers in the city who relied on external engineers who supply, put their stamp of approval on if this work is done, it will resolve the problem. Well, it didn't resolve the problem. I have been a supporter of the stormwater management program. As a matter of fact, I've been promoting diverting water into man-made ponds. You'll see a man-made pond, not that I was responsible for the one at Downsview Lands, but I am responsible for the pond that was created at Maple Leaf Park and the water pond that's going to be created in front of the Ingram Transfer Station in Ward 12. It's going to be done. Thank you. Thank you. What's lacking is leadership. We don't have it. Plain and simple, we don't have leadership. When something's wrong, you have no one to call. You're, you know, figure it out yourself. You know, you don't have any assistance. Say, hey, this is the resource that's available to you. None of that in this community. I've been here for all my life. I didn't even know I had a city councilor. I didn't know what it was because so many problems went, you know, unchecked. You know, we just figured, you know, we just manage. And that's what all of you have to do. You have to dip into your own pocket and you have to fix it. You shouldn't have to. You pay taxes and it's going up. Why, why should you pay more taxes when the minimal isn't being taken care of? Like simply not having floods in your basement. This is, this is basic stuff. And if I'm elected, I'm telling you, I'm going to lead on this. This ward is going to be priority. I'm not going to make excuses. I'm not going to take so-called a heat when your ankles are wet. It makes no sense. I am going to resolve this. I want to be the leader. I grew up here. I love this place. And I came here to represent you and speak the passion. In my, this is the passion I would bring. Okay? If you guys are suffering, I'm suffering. Thank you, friend. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. It's really important. A lot of our neighbors were flooded five years ago flooded three years ago, and again this year. It's disheartening. People are scared to go on vacation because they're worried about their basements flooding. In our community, I don't think that's okay. The thing that's really disheartening about our failed leadership is they voted against the storm water management. On top of that, Francis voted against accelerating the wet weather flow management system here. So instead of you getting the support you needed right now to accelerate it, they want to wait. You have to pay twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 every time your basement's flood. I don't think that's okay. What I want to do here is, again, I want to ensure that there's a local planning committee made up of you, my office, and the planning department to ensure that we have to be proactive. We cannot ground any new development until we ensure that our infrastructure is solid and good to go. Frank brought $40 million into this community and still our basements are flooding. That is lack of accountability. And we need to change that and we need leadership that understands that you have to be at the center of the decision making in our community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, next question. <clears throat> yes, well, Toronto is certainly, uh, from a transportation perspective, a very busy place. But many people in this neighborhood can't afford vehicles, and so I would like to know what steps you would take in detail and specific actions to improve 
bicycle infrastructure, as well as pedestrian safety here. Thank you. So, uh, so, do you need to call someone else out? No, no. okay, thank you. Cedric. Thank you for the question. We live in a bit of a transit desert over here. We see the improvements coming, <clears throat> but I'm talking about the little things that we can do, relatively affordable, that makes a difference. Many of the individuals who live in our ward work in the service industry. That means that weekends don't come for them. A weekend day is just another regular day of the work week for them. We need to work on having more frequent buses on weekends during the rush hour times to ensure that these people don't require double the time to get home from the regular shifts that they have. Talk about rapid transit. Jane originally was supposed to have a streetcar. It didn't happen. We need much more buses, articulating buses so that we can move more people through the area. We can't ignore the needs that we have. We had a plan, the plan was gone. We need to bring the plan back. Thank you for that question. I believe transit is the future. I ride the 89 bus every day when I'm not riding my bicycle along Western Road. So I know how important having infrastructure to keep us safer on our bikes, also to keep our kids safer on the sidewalks is in this community because I live it. I don't own a car. I believe in my core that transit is the future. Again, unlike our current incumbents who voted to cut service to the TTC in 2011 and 2016 in the budgets. Cut service to the TTC. I want to increase service in our, in our transit system and I want to keep it public because privatization is going to hurt transit in this community. It's going to hike up fares and it's going to give us uh, worse service. That is part of my transit platform, but what I want to do also is I want to get more people on their bikes too. But the only way I can expect more people to ride their bikes is if the infrastructure's here, but also bike share isn't in York Southwest. And there are so many examples of how we need to be connecting the city better. And part of my platform is expanding bike share to York Southwest. It's better connectivity between the Up Express and the TTC. It's bike lanes on Weston Road and throughout York Southwest. And implementing Vision Zero to keep our roads safer for cyclists and pedestrians. Thank, Thank you. you. actually supported um, uh, increasing the budget for City Vision, City's Vision Zero Road Safety Plan. And as well, um, I, uh, there was a committee that was formed with residents in, uh, throughout the, the ward um, on uh, the safety plan, which um, uh, we brought forward a number of recommendations to the council, uh, to the executive committee, and it was, in, it was actually was endorsed by the works committee. Um, for example, reducing speed limits, um, putting uh, bicycle lanes along West, uh, Western Road, Scarlet Road, St. Clair, um, implementing speed humps in certain areas, um, having uh, motorcycles getting uh, added uh, as a vulnerable road user. That's, I've done that. And I did that. So that's not new. And as far as transit, Councillor Layton, yeah. Councillor Layton and I moved a motion at council that was carried unanimously as well. And Councillor Layton talks about it all the time and how we were successfully um, we advocated to request Metrolinx to reduce the, the fare to go for the go, st uh, the go train to TTC fares, and it was and it was implemented, and we moved that motion, and I'm very proud that they actually acknowledged it and they did reduce the fare. So I have done all of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have in the past supported um, increasing bicycle lanes throughout the city. But I try to apply what I call a reasonableness test. And the test would, I think I voted against cycle lanes on Young Street north of Shepherd, going up to Finch and further north. I voted against it. Because if you're familiar with that street, that was the same street where someone with mental problems ended up driving his van onto the uh, sidewalk. Can you imagine if there were some cyclists on that road as well? 
you have to, there has to be a path, there has to be, there has to be a cycle, a cycle network, but not all on arterial roads. That's all I'm saying. We need to put in an integrated cycling path system, but that doesn't mean it has, it could be along the hydro corridor. We need to look at... He doesn't want cycle. Shame. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Can we let our candidate speak, please? Thank you. Fred? Well, I don't need to say anything. You see it in action. These are our politicians. <laughs> I am a transit operator. For nearly 10 years, I've been driving streetcar around St. Clair, King. I see it all. And I see there's a disparity between how, what goes on downtown and what goes on here. If something, if they need service downtown, they get it. One guy was complaining about the streetcars being too loud at King and Sumac, and they had this, the CEO for that one guy was standing at the corner. How many times do you guys complain and you get anything done? You guys don't, because you're not a priority, because you don't have leadership. They don't, they don't care. They don't even ride the transit. The top four dangerous transit but routes are in this board here. Keel Street, Lawrence, Weston Road, Eglinton, these are the most dangerous and most underserved routes in, how can that be? The top four all here, ladies and gentlemen, here's what I'm gonna do, okay? A lot of you guys are seniors. I want half price for seniors during rush hour, okay? Not rush hour. You guys deserve it. A lot of you guys are aging and you guys are on fixed income. You need half price. Also, if you're on using tokens or fares, Thank you. you should have two hour transfers as well. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my specialty. I want to talk to you. We're going to get this solved because we can. All right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. So, I, I believe strongly that we need better bus service in this ward. I take the 52 every day downtown, and we are packed in there, and it's late most of the time. I believe strongly that we need increased bus service, and we need articulated in the longer buses. On top of that, our cycling infrastructure, I want to ensure that it connects to the key parts of our neighborhood, like the new recreation hub. We want to make sure it connects to the GO Transit. We want to make sure it connects to the new Mount Dennis Station and other stations happening locally so you can get to work quicker. On top of that, we want to make sure that you, if you want to ride downtown, you have that ability and the opportunity to do it. We need new leadership in our community that is thinking about long-term use, not reactive politics, but actually forward thinking and thinking about how we can better get you to work, get you home to your family and to your young children. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, we do need better leadership. You are the one is the taxpayers. The taxpayers speak. If the taxpayers say they want better transit, it should be done. Cause each and every one of us pay our taxes. I'm along Western Road. There's a lot of potholes. People that don't have a proper bike lane. People in a wheelchair. The child have to be sharing the, the lane with some sometimes with the bicycle people. We need better transit. Transit should be on Western Road every five minutes. People can be able to go what they have to do. It's not every 15 or 20 minutes. That is wrong. Because downtown have the best, the mean York Southwestern should have the best. And if you let I will make certain you have the best. Thank you. Thank you. You know, when Mount Dennis Community Association was formed, we almost had t-shirts printed that said, what's good enough for Rosedale is good enough for Mount Dennis. And I think that's what we're hearing tonight. Thank you. Sorry. Could we have an Anne-Marie up for the question after Mike? I've been resident of Weston for the past 27 years. Um, to all the candidates, 
will you commit to increasing TTC funding so we can have better service and lower fares? And what's your position on the threatened upload of the TTC subway to the province? Will you commit to keeping transit public? Thank you. Kiana? Thank you, Mike, for the question. I have already committed to keeping transit public and signing the Keeping Transit Public Pledge with the ATU Local 113. I've also already committed to doing those things. I do believe that we need to be keeping our transit system public. And that is important because it protects consumers and it protects workers. It makes sure that the people who are operating our TTC have decent jobs. And that's important in a community like this because there are many workers who are working for the TTC in this community. So one, absolutely I'm committed to keeping our transit system public. And unlike, again, our two current councillors, I'm not afraid to stand up to the Premier. When he wants, when he wants to upload and privatize our transit system, you can be sure that you will have a representative at City Hall fighting to keep our transit public. So I can commit to that, I can commit to that over and over and over again. I believe in keeping our TTC public, I want to keep it public, and I won't be afraid to stand up to the Premier to do that. Thank you. Thank you. I've never been afraid to stand up to the Premier. <laughs> I've, I've, uh, I'll tell you. I have... We have the pictures. Oh, well. I have signed that pledge as well, and I do not support um, uh, privatization of the TTC. Absolutely not. And I signed that pledge as well. And as far as uh, putting more funding into T uh, TTC, we did at the last budget meeting, we did last year, we did put more money into the budget. Um, there was, unfortunately, um, there was one, uh, there was $20 million that, uh, that there was a motion to transfer $20 million into the TTC uh, budget which I did support because that $20 million was coming out of the police budget and that would have meant reducing uh, the number of police officers we have on the street, so I did not vote for that. Um, I didn't support, although it wasn't my responsibility to make the decision to privatize Highway 407. The provincial government made that decision uh, I am against privatization of even garbage collection, 100% across the city. I've always said, no more, if you're going to privatize garbage collection, no more than 50%. Why? Because I believe it keeps both sides competitive. One reason and one reason only why I believe they should just meet each other's performance levels. Now, with respect to increase in TTC funding, absolutely, I believe the city should be increasing TTC funding, but that needs to be based on priorities. We all know that somebody is clamoring for a downtown relief line, which costs big money. Someone else wants a subway to Scarborough. Someone else, including me, wants to see the Eglinton LRT extended to Pearson Airport. Again, which one should go first? Which one should receive the money? And when it comes to increase in funding major projects, I actually believe it should be funded through debt. Thank you. Thank you. As a TTC operator myself, I can tell you firsthand that privatization will kill the TTC. What, what is privatization? Well, pretty much it puts your transit into the hands of corporations. What's a corporation's primary concern? To make profit. They will make profit on you, meaning Lines that are underperforming are going to get cut. This is the fear. It's going on already. They've already privatized maintenance workers. They've, they're starting already. And what does that mean? Like, it, this place is already underserved as it is. We can't afford privatization. We can't afford to throw money 
Because that's what we're doing. We're throwing money at bad. I'm telling you, there's a lot of waste going on at the TTC. I'm probably going to get fired for telling you this. But <laughs> I'm telling you, there's a lot of waste going on, a lot of management that should not be there. Okay? And the operators, why is, why is your transit late? I'm telling you why it's late right now, because there's not enough operators. Okay? A lot of them are having to go home because of overtime issues. They don't have manpower. So throwing money without good direction is not going to do anything. We need to find where the waste is, and we need to fix that problem. Look, when the Toronto Metropolitan Zoo wants someone to I run it, friend. they get a zoologist. Why are we getting politicians to run a transit operation? It doesn't make sense. Ladies and gentlemen, vote for me. I'm going to want to be TTC chair, and I'm going to fix this, because I know where the problems are firsthand. Thank you. Me? I think we can all agree that we need to keep transit public. We need to ensure because it is our community that will suffer. Our incumbents voted against de it actually to decrease service in our neighborhood. We don't want that to happen anymore. We need better and more accessible supports and transit in our neighborhood. Secondly, we absolutely need more money in the transit plan. We need to ensure that local infrastructure for the transit systems including making sure that there's more bus service but hiring more people, right, and ensuring that those people come from our neighborhoods because we have the third lowest, like, poverty rate in the city. So we need to ensure that we bring, we, we keep it public, we invest in the right places, and we bring more jobs here to York Southwest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On my watch, it will never be privatized. Never. Because I believe a better TTC transit is better for the community. We're supposed to put more money into TTC, not cutting it. We're supposed to have better TTC for the seniors and for the people who live in this area. And if it's me be elected, I will make certain TTC will never be touched and privatized. And my colleague said there just now that she was stopped at Dock 40. Good luck. Right, because I know who I'm dealing with. He is a bully. And the rest of them cannot stop the Dock 40 except me. Drug dealer. Right, and I will stand up to Dock 40 and tell Dock 40 enough is enough. You will never cut. The DTC. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, thank you for the question. Transit is a great equalizer. You can't privatize that. You can't privatize the ability of someone in the West traveling to the East at an affordable rate. Of course, we need to increase money that goes into transit. But that also comes with putting pressure on the mayor, other councillors, to look at our provincial representatives and make sure that they add their fair share. It's not about them taking away our transit, it's about them investing into our transit. It's ours. Our tax dollars have already paid for it. It stays here. One of the incumbents was talking about priority. We can't have bad transit like this and say it's a priority at the same time. If you elect me, whatever the budget is, that 125th, I make sure that that money comes here and it stays here, it circulates here, it's used here. Transform TO is the City of Toronto's 
climate change plan. It was uh, newly adopted by council, and it sets a very aggressive climate change goal of reducing our emissions, uh, our greenhouse gas emissions, 80% by 2050. So I, I'd like to hear how the candidates feel we can meet that very aggressive climate change goal. Thank, Thank you. you. Francis. Thank you very much for that question. And climate change is very real, as you can see our temperature today. Um, so we, we all need to take part in climate change and to reduce emissions. So I, uh, I moved a motion to have full funding for Transform Teal, the city's climate action plan that was put back in the budget. Originally it was taken out of the budget and I moved a motion to have that uh, put back in the budget. I've also advocated for a creation of a community energy plan for Mount Dennis with the support of the local residents. So at the Kodak land, originally Metro Links was going to um, put a gas plant. And I was successful in getting a motion through executive committee to ask Metro Links to not proceed with that plan and ask the city and Toronto Hydro to go in partnership. And I was very successful in that. And as well is that um, we had the, um, um, the the gas power generator that's now at the Mount Dennis Maintenance and Storage Facility, which is thanks to the uh, Mount Dennis Community Association that advocated as well to Metro Lakes and made deputations to the Executive Committee. So thank you very much, and um, I think that's a very important question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think Council unanimously supported um, dealing with climate change and trying to achieve certain objectives over a number of years. It's not the first time council makes such decisions, but invariably, invariably, there is something else that has to be decided on. And I'll go back to about 10 years ago when the city was under so much financial pressure from the province that the city opted to introduce a new tax known as the Municipal Land Transfer Tax. The Municipal Land Transfer Tax did not apply to everybody. Didn't apply to, well, didn't apply to seniors who chose to live in their homes because they lived there for a long time. It applied only to people who had money and who were, were improving their living or homes. They, they were selling one home and occupying another. What we need going forward to really address climate change is we need a new tax measure introduced to address climate change. And I'm not sure what it is. Thank you. Fred? No more taxes, ladies and gentlemen. You pay enough taxes, you don't need to pay more. Like, my uh, point over here, he, he voted for you guys to have tolls. Can you imagine that? The only reason it isn't implemented is because the Liberals, you know, they want it, it was an election year. Otherwise, you guys would be paying toll, more taxes, and get crumbling infrastructure. It just makes no sense. The best way to, you know, help with climate change is get more roads off the cars. That's, you know, more cars off the road. And we need better transit. You know, it's right now, if you try to, if you try to, like, go to work, you're going to, you, there's high probability you're going to be late. <laughs> You know, if you take transit, you're going to be late. That's why we need to work on transit. Like in New York, nobody drives. Everybody takes transit. Everybody takes the subway. That's how they get around. We, we need to elevate ourselves. Look at our subway line. It's, it's horrendous. You know, they want to expand it, but it's going to be the same. Compare our transit line to New York, Chicago, any other place. We're, unfortunately, we're not world class. We're not world class. We could be great, but we're not there yet. We need to make transit great, so that way people say, you know what, I'm going to yeah. save money, I'm going to take the transit instead of using my car. This is the best way. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. You can. Thank you so much for that question. So there's two things that I would want to do. City owns a lot of buildings across the city. I will make sure that all buildings are green buildings. All city-owned buildings are green buildings. We have a huge footprint, and we can make a significant dent there. The second thing is, in our community, we need more green space. We need to ensure that we have greenery so our basements are not flooded and we can, they can actually soak up water. Right now, we're thinking about development, but we're not thinking about these <coughs> things that are actually critical right, to our community. And of course, transit is important. 
right? We get more cars off the road, right? Or at least we give people good options to be able to get around without driving. So more green infrastructure, so our basement's not flooding. Make sure that there's, you know, our, our buildings, our city-owned buildings are green buildings, right? And support our community in a really intentional way. Thank you so much for that question. The environment, we have to learn one thing. More trees, whoever is the polluter, go after them, tax them. Because I believe you tax whoever doing the pollution. You will get more money coming and you're able to find them and tell them, can I do it anymore? They mean they have to improve on the system, on the buildings especially that have to improve on. And that's what I would do. Thank you. Thank you. Anne-Marie, a very timely question. When it comes to climate change, we all have a dog in the fight, but not all of us are equally willing to pay our portion to it. These things cost. These things cost. We can't say no taxes and expect our environment just to get better. What we need to do, and one of the things that I really believe in, is that in a green area like here, we find ways about exporting the green that we have to other areas of the city. We have the Humber River right beside us, right? We have the flats. There's lots of green area here. What we need to do is have other areas of the city also mimic what it is that we have here. Of course, transit, improved transit, people get out of cars, less CO2 in the air. It's not rocket science. We just have to be willing to do it. We have to commit, and I'm willing to make that commitment. I think the incumbents have been forgetting about their voting record, but I'll be happy to tweet it out to them after this debate. In February 2017, both of the incumbents voted to not fully fund Transform TO. Not fully fund it. This is a plan that will take a look at climate change and take action around it. In addition to fully funding and committing to fully funding Transform TO, I want to speak a little bit about my experience. I've done international human rights work and I was playing a role with several international human, or human rights organizations to put a human rights perspective into the sustainable development goals. A lot of the things that we were fighting for at that global level weren't happening in the community that I was from. And it's why I came back to work in this community. Because those sustainable development goals, those large targets that we see in Transform TO, require the buy-in of local governments. That is the only way that we will achieve them. So yes, it means making sure we're pressuring and all future development is green development. Net Zero, I'm so proud to come from Mount Dennis, who is spearheading the initiative to become a Net Zero community. I'm also, it also has a huge role to play in transit. We need to get more people out of cars, but we need to build a transit system that can accommodate more people. And I'm getting the red, red one, so I'm done for now, but I'll talk to you more about this later. Thank you. And I think this is our last question. Well, it was a real toss up, but I'm gonna go with my companion's choice. This is from Stephanie. Stephanie, I'm gonna just read it out. If not elected, how will you continue to work to build up York South Weston? Do not say I'll sit in a corner and cry. Frank! <laughs> well, you could sit in a corner for a little bit. Well, that's an interesting question, but I can tell you this. If I'm not elected, and I've already made it very clear, to the people in my area, that is Ward 12. I will continue to be available to help them in any way I can. I will continue to be available to use my expertise to make sure that anybody tries to do anything to endanger the interests and the rights of my community will have to go through me. Any developer knows that they have to go through me. And any developer that doesn't know that gets a real stern lesson. 
Fred. Fred. I think he's that's right. They have to go through him. Money. That's what funds this place. Money. If you want to develop, you got to give him some change. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm not talking Andy, I'm not going to be taking money. We're not talking about going through me and having to go through me and pay me. Fred, go, go, hey, look who funds this campaign. Go through the city. It's all in record who he gets funds from. And let me, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll do it for you. I'll tweet it out. I'll let you know who's funding his campaign. And they're the developers. But any alpha cost me $12,000. In any event, what I'm, what's going to happen, well, right now I'm currently a transit operator. Okay? But this is bigger than that. You know, this is why a lot of people were, you know, saying, how come transit is so bad? I'm like, well, you got to speak to your politician. They're the ones who control it. I'm going to be continuing to advocate for transit. I'm going to continue to advocate for this community. I set up shop here. I should have set up a small business here. And that's what we need to do. We need to support small businesses. I am going to continue to support small businesses. I have a YouTube channel, Fred Fosu blog, and I'm going to be promoting all of the businesses here because that's what we need. We need to shop locally. And that's what, I, if you have a business, reach out to me. I want to promote you guys, and I want to make you guys go viral. But hey, I'm in it to win it. That's why I'm running. To win, to be your leader, to be your champion, to have the passion that I have for this community. I want to represent you and bring that to City Hall, where these politicians who don't thank care. You, thank you. So in 2014, I came 1,300 votes away from winning <clears throat> my first time. My goal is to represent you this time. But I'll tell you what I've been doing. So we'll tell you what I will continue to do regardless. I started the 12 community alliance in this community. And we worked with Mount Dennis to ensure that we pressured Kodak, right, and pressured Metrolinx to ensure that we, had, we, we did not have a gas plant in our neighborhood. On top of that, I was the, I'm the co-chair of the Toronto Community, Community Network. And that organization, we, met, we made sure that 10% of jobs on the Eglinton LRT that's being built right now is local jobs in our area. Beyond that, I fought with, 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 with landlords in this community. We've gone to court at, on Lawrence, on, on Warner to ensure that rent is affordable for our people. Beyond that, we've also made sure that when people's basements are flooded, I brought the city of Toronto into our community and made sure that they spoke to our neighborhood. This is who I am. I want to serve. And I would look forward to working with you as your city councilor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I will work. Now the question was if you're not elected. Oh, if I'm not elected. <laughs> what will you continue to do? I will continue doing the same thing helping other people in the community. Right, I will continue fighting for you folks. Same way. And I will continue doing my best for this community and continue standing up to the slum landlords and to the and to the other rest of people who are doing wrong with crime and everything. I will continue fighting for you folks. Thank you. Thank you. For me this isn't a zero sum game. It isn't, oh you don't win, just pack your bags and you know, you go off. Engagement in my building the direct neighborhood of where I live, just by city Bellsley, I'll continue to engage with my neighbors, with the young, with the youth, those individuals who may or may not, may or may not have guidance, but to offer it. We have to start treating each other with respect. We have to start engaging each and every one of us like family. It's only when we start to do that, when we start to see real improvements in this community. And for me, that won't stop. Thank you. Thank you. 
What I will do if I am not elected to be your city councilor here in New York Southwestern is to continue to do what I have been doing. And that's standing up for this community, it's standing up for the people who live here. And I am working with community organizations and starting community initiatives here to make sure that we are put back on the map. And I can say that just throughout my campaign, and keep this in mind, this is someone who is not your city councillor yet. And this campaign has already had so many victories. So if I'm not elected, I will continue to be pushing for those victories, like getting that big blue model home at the corner of Jane and Weston Road taken down. Getting just a few weeks ago, the folks in, in two Bellsley, um, no, Bellsley is in the other community, getting the, the residents in the Toronto Community Housing Building that were, had their water shut off for 48 hours, getting donations to them and then pressuring our city councillors to actually take action on a Sunday to get their water put back on. Those are the kinds of victories that my community, my campaign has had already and you better believe I will continue doing that because it's what I've been doing in this community my whole life as a social worker here. But I hope you vote for me because I want to win. Thank you. Thank you. hoping that all the candidates that are here are saying that are saying how much they're going to do what they're going to do um, well I mean until they decided they were going to run for council I never seen them they weren't around they didn't attend meetings they only got involved because they decided to run for council Lee can tries to take credit for the Kodak plan I've never seen him at a meeting not one meeting about the Kodak plan but he's taking credit for it I don't know where that's from and for the water at Five Bellevue, I got the water turned on. Kira called the media. She did a, she did a, a, a scrum. She was there to get publicity. I shut the water off. So I'm just hoping that everyone here that says what they're going to do, they continue doing that and not just saying that because they want to get elected. section of the evening when each of the candidates will have 30 seconds to present their elevator pitch. When you are 15 seconds away from the end, you will see the orange card and then you will see the red card and the doors will shut on the elevator and you'll have to finish. Okay, so Cedric started first last time at the opening comments, so Chiara, you can start this time. Over the next four years, fundamental decisions are going to be made for the future of this community. But the question for this election is very simple. Do we want to continue with the status quo that has been failing us for 30 years? Or do we want to demand change? If you think it's time for change, then vote Chiara Paravani for city councillor. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, development and, and uh, uh, programs that I've been working on in Weston and Mount Dennis. Uh, we're revitalizing Mount Dennis and Weston, and the vote for the next councillor is very important because you vote for the for the candidate for, and for the councillor that can handle both wards. And I have a proven record that I can handle both boards as being the former mayor of the city of York. And you don't have a choice but to vote Nunziata. Thank you. You know, I think one, one thing that we all as uh, candidates share is good intentions. But there's a difference between good intentions and knowledge of process. Knowledge of process that understands that a municipality is a creature of the province and therefore has constraints with respect to what they can do. Right. I am the only candidate with the ability to insist on adherence to due process 
and demand reasonable outcomes. That's my proven track record. So if you want results that are desirable for a community, vote to Georgia. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you always have a choice, okay? For 30 years, you had no choice. You felt that you need to put up with not like You had to put up with uh, councils that don't do anything for you. But you have a choice. Don't listen to what anybody says, okay? You always have a choice. And in this choice, it's very clear. If you think we're going in the right direction, if you think your roads are good, your trans is awesome, and you know, crime is great, you know, Vote for the incumbents because they're responsible. <laughs> I'm telling you, vote for the incumbents if you think this place is great. But if you're like me and think, you know, we could do way better in transit crime, there's only one choice, and it's Fred Fosu. Thank you. Thank you all for this amazing debate. On October 22nd, we have an opportunity to end 30 years of neglect in our community. I have been in this neighborhood. I have experience as a nonprofit executive, as a business executive, and as a leader in government. I've done it before. We don't have to put up with good enough. Four years ago, I came 1,300 votes away from winning. This election, I want to cross the finish line with you together. Thank you so much. Thank you. With my two incumbent, it's the same old face saying all the time. Same broken promises. I fed up of the broken promises. I fed up of my rest of, rest of colleagues saying they would do what they do, would, wouldn't do. And I would tell you, if you vote for me, you'll have my phone number, you'll call me any time of the night and tell me what is the problem and I will get it fixed. On that day, I want you to elect Keaton Austin as your next city council for, for, for your Arco Western. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if I've ever heard more knees and eyes in the last two minutes. I'm here for us. I live here, you live here, we're here together. What do we do to make a difference? You need someone who's in it for the community and not for themselves. Whether it be 30 years or looking at that key saying, I've almost got it, no. Nah. Vote for someone who respects you and respects the community. Thank you. Well, I would like to uh, thank you all for some excellent questions. I hope you're, you've uh, had a few answers that you came uh, looking for and uh, for sitting in a very hot room. I won't say anything about hot air and political candidates. Um, and I'm sure they will be happy to speak to you outside the building. We have to clear the building at nine o'clock. And given that there were quite a few negative things that we were talking about, if you live in Mount Dennis, it's the greenest neighborhood in the city. We have wonderful spaces. Western is so go out and breathe the fresh air and tell everybody to vote. Let's increase the vote. Get people out to vote on the 22nd. Thank you very much. Thank you, candidates.